I'll begin. Dear Father, we uh, thank you for this day. Again, Lord, I thank you for these students, and just pray you bless our work today, Lord. In your name I pray. Amen. All right, so I'm going to try to cut through this section and just highlight the parts I think are most interesting. Um, as I was just telling you guys a second ago, you know, the, the blessing and the curse of Dummett and Foote is that they have so much material. Um, a lot of it, I would say, is really appropriate for reading, but not, you know, it's kind of the, you know, if you're going to put a foundation in a house, certain things you need to know. But they just don't make for interesting conversation. It's kind of like that. I don't know. Although Dr. Joseph was talking about how would he cut a, a two-inch hole through 10 inches of concrete four feet down from the top. We're all debating how that should be done. I don't know. I, my, my, my suggestion was to drill like 10 smaller holes that he already has the equipment for. Make like a you know, perforation and then chisel it out or something. That's a horrible suggestion. We're talking at least a day of work there. His brand was like, just go to the rental place. You know, or there's some some plumber who already drilled a similar hole. He's like, go hire that plumber. And we're all various competing. <laughs> to go back to Dr. Joseph and find out what he actually did. Of course, the the initial and and uh, very unhelpful comment was, well, you should put a uh, two inch PVC pipe, and then when you pour the concrete, you'll have the hole. And uh, he's like, well, that's great, but. We didn't know where the electric was going in when we poured the foundation, so it's not really a helpful. Not to mention the, in the absence of time travel, you know. So <laughs> you can guess which professor said, go back and put a two-inch PVC pipe That's here. That was not me. But anyway, um, let R be a commutative ring with one. with unity, and we've got M, N, L, all left R modules. Then the map, the map. It's a map, it's a map, it's a map, it's a map. Uh, M and L is called are bilinear if V of R1 M1 plus R2 M2 comma N and V of M comma R1 N1 plus R2 N2 equal to equal to for all M, M1, M2, and M, and N, N1, N2, and N, and R1, R2, and R. So you can guess, you can, you can complete these. You know, I think you already know, right? We have R1, V of M1, comma N, plus R2. So this is just the natural extension of linearity, right? Well, bilinearity, I suppose, over a field. Um, I mean, you could think of it as linearity in both slots, right? And um, so there's a theorem 10 I skipped over, but with this terminology, theorem 10 becomes the following corollary 12. Um, again, with the data above, R commutative ring, M and N left modules, let M tensor Rn um, be tensor product of M and N over R. So what is that? That's M. Cartesian product n mod the Pac-Man we talked about last time, right? Right, and, and so that's, in other words, the set of m tensor n, 
cosets such that m, um, you know, mn. Remembering that that's a that's the coset. I mean, m, m. If you want to, here's a formula: m tensor n is equal to m comma n plus that. So, I thought there's not enough notation in Demet and Foot. Let me uh, let me add yet more notation. Um, but sometimes it's nice to have a notation for something as opposed to the subgroup generated by the relations which define the tensor product, which is a lot to say. I prefer Pac-Man. Yes. So a simple definition: B of M1n is like itself an algorithm. Yeah. Um, right. Yeah, so that's a linear, co the, uh, the right-hand side is a linear, com I mean, both of these are values in L, and um, they're related as, a, as, as given, yeah. Which is to say that phi is bilinear. Now, if the case, in the case that um, R is a field, and M and N are vector spaces, you know, um, this is just plain old bilinearity over a vector space. Um, for example, the metric or like the inner product in a vector space would be like this. Um, their L being just the real numbers itself, or perhaps the complex numbers for a complex inner product. You know? um, but yeah. Or you could do something more exotic, like M is R3, N is R3, L is R3, and uh, this could be the cross product. Cross product is an example of a bilinear map. Right. Dot product, cross product. Yeah. Um, Let's see, what else could you do? I think you could do um, M, is, M and N are sets of matrices, say, uh, of multipliable size. Then you could let phi of A comma B be AB. That would be bilinear. I mean, it, yeah, there's, there's tons. This is so many things, possibly, yeah. But, um, Anyway, um, here's the corollary. So M tensor, M tensor R, <coughs> um, tensor product of M, and a, where M is given the standard R module structure, then um, and what that means is we've only, if you think about so if it's where M is given the standard R module structure, what does that mean? That's something I skipped over, but we can easily fill in. See, we're only given that M is a left R module, all right? So what's this mean? But we defined, if you recall yesterday, I mean, Thursday doesn't count. So um, we, we, we defined the tensor product of two modules for a, a right R module on this factor and a left R module on that factor, if I recall correctly. So M is given to be a left R module. What do we mean? How can we define this? Well, the, that, all that means is you define Rm to be equal to, watch for it, watch for it, Mr. Okay, so you essentially do what we always do in vector spaces, which is sometimes write scalar multiplications on the right, and no one knows the difference because we just assume that scalar multiplication commutes with vectors, and that's the standard by module structure that we work with in vector spaces, and we still work with it here when it suits us. So that's what we mean by standard R module structure, is that we can define a right multiplication of ring elements by just formally assuming that that multiplication commutes with the elements of the module in, in the natural way. Anyway, so given that structure, <clears throat> I'll get to it eventually here, then this, so this is the thing you, somebody, I forget which one of you, Somebody here was asking the question, well, how is this an R module? Because we only described it as an abelian group last time, really. We haven't described how, I don't think we had described yet, how you multiply in there. What's the module structure there? How do we act on that abelian set by a ring, by the ring R? Well, here's how you do it. Then, although I think it's going to be rather anticlimactic, R acting on M tensor N 
right, is equal to, well, it's equal to Rm tensor n, which, by the way, is equal to M tensor Rn. And the map, oh, I hate this letter. I hate it with a perfect hatred. Yoda of, um, from the Cartesian product of Mn into the tensor product over R of M and N is what? Fill in the blank map. What's that? R yeah, R bilinear. And then the larger point here is that there's a direct correspondence between R bilinear maps and homomorphisms from the tensor, tensor product into something else. All right, in particular, we have the following diagram. We have M cross N, the stupid map into M tensor Rn, and so this diagram commutes in particular to each R bilinear map phi, there corresponds a um, R module homomorphism, big phi, which are related by assuming the, um, the diagram commutes. There's a direct correspondence between if you give me a sideways TIE fighter, I can give you this, this guy. I don't, I don't have a name for him. What is that? It's like a... <laughs> it's a what composed by Oda? Oh, you're, you're, yeah, you're fine. You math person, you. All right. <laughs> what is it? A body builder without a torso. It reminds me of a pinwheel. A, a pinwheel. I think pinwheel. A lollipop? Lollipop, perhaps, yeah. It kind of depends on how I'm drawing it exactly, but uh, but uh, King, of course, gave us a more useful comment, which was that this was equal to oh. phi composed, big phi composed with the stupid map. Yeah, I mean the Yoda. So yeah, that is also true. And the proof is given on page 368, and um, it's really nothing terribly exciting. It basically points out that this data gives you middle linearity. And then he has an earlier theorem which, which links middle linear maps to homomorphisms of tensor products. And so it, we get this as well. And if you go back to the proof of the middle linear theorem, you'll find also that it's nothing terribly deep. It's really just filtering through definitions. It's not. Yeah, this is the universal property. Of the what? Oh, the big five must be given, given the small Given the small fee, there exists a unique big fee. Yeah, that's, it's an, I think you're right, I think it's an example of a universal. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, and, and, and of course, uh, emphasizing the category um, theoretic structure here is something that my teaching has not yet reached, unfortunately. Um, but if you wanted to give a talk on universal properties, that would also be a, an acceptable topic. There's a section on category theory in the uh, Rotman book, if you'd rather do that. Well, see, category theory as a, as a subject is deep and difficult, but to introduce it in a 30-minute talk is mostly just a lot of, like, we did this, and we did this, and look, that's an example of this, and that's an example of this, and you basically have three major definitions you need to state, and a couple of low-lying theorems 
There aren't a lot of theorems in category theory. A lot of definitions, a lot of concepts. Relatively few theorems. We should have you do category theory. That way, I don't have to talk about it. You want me to do that? Yeah, yeah. I'll do it. That way, I, now I, now she has you have you have given me an excuse not to talk about it, <laughs> um, which is just honest because I yeah sorry. I mean, I'm not happy about it. It's. <laughs> I think it would be a healthy thing to have a. Uh, I think every re I think every undergraduate major at this point should have like a reading course in category theory. It should be like a little one-hour course, which is just devoted to talking about it. Maybe it's not something you guys should be graded on, but you should at least talk about it. <laughs> right. OK, anyway, so um, examples. Um, here's one. So M, M tensor 0. So this is in any, you know, just the context we're working here, M and N left R modules. I'm not being very specific. I want to show that. How would you show that this is equal to zero using the, uh, you know, I wrote down the properties of the tensor product last time. They're, they're implicit within what we made Pac-Man, right? Basically that we have distributivity and associativity of the ring multiplication through the, you know, through the tensor. So is this, this would be what, M tensor? I mean, zero is what? Zero plus zero, right? which would be m tensor 0 plus m tensor 0, I believe. Yeah. So, but we're in an abelian group, right? It's a quotient of abelian groups, which is again an abelian group, so we have law of cancellation. So this implies that anything tensor 0 is 0, right? And, and likewise. That was supposed to be an L. Something happened on the way to. All right. So also zero tensor n is obviously equal to zero, right? And this is for any any tensor product of m and n over some ring, right? That's his first example. We exploited that to show that z mod two z tensor z mod three z was equal to zero last time. Right, that was the second example. And then um, number three. Well, his actually his next argument. And the rest of that, he shows that z mod two z tensor z mod two z is actually z, z mod two z again. So again, this goes with a larger intuition. If you just want to have an intuition for how to do tensor products, it's a it's a tool for extending st scalars. So for example, if I take, um, you know, I'll come back to his example three, but just, you know, here's some intuitive. And we could prove these things, of course, but here's some intuitive calculations. So if I have a vector space over the reals, right? And I look at the reals tensor of that vector space, well, guess what? Up to isomorphism, it's just the vector space again. Um, if I have, you know, if I have z, if I take z tensor z, guess what? It's Z again. I mean, pretty much, if you take a ring with its usual structure and you tensor it with itself, you get the ring again. So these are things we can, we can prove. I mean, I say equality, but really isomorphism, of course, because these are actually what? It's the you know, it's the Cartesian product mod Pac-Man as appropriate. So these are not strictly speaking equal because they're different types of objects, but up to isomorphism, they're the same. R module isomorphism, which in this case is straight up real R module isomorphism, Z module isomorphism, and R module isomorphism again. 
okay, so you guys can probably guess from what I've already written in 2 what's going to happen in 3. If we have z um, mod mz, tensor z mod nz, that's going to be isomorphic to what? z mod dz, right? Where d is what? Yeah. Let's see here. How does he how does he establish this? You know, let's go through some of the calculations which affirm this reality. So he says, let d equal to the greatest common divisor of m and n, right? If we look at um, a, so let's just look at in integers a tensor b over. So this is again, this is tensor over the uh, integers, right? This is a z tensor. So if we look at a tensor b, we can look at that as what? We can look at that as a tensor b times 1, right? Which we can also look at as a b tensor 1, right? Which we can look at as a b times 1 tensor 1. And he says, this shows that this thing, right, is abelian group with generator one tensor one. It's a cyclic, in fact, it's cyclic rather. It's a cyclic group, I should say, not abelian. Cyclic, cyclic. But of course, I'm just looking at integers at the moment. But if you think of those as being representatives for residue classes mod m and mod n, right? That's what we need to do to think about what's the order of one tensor one in the tensor product. So what's the order of what? what you know, what's the order of this? How we figure that out? So if we think about that, the order should be the smallest, smallest number, let's say k, such that k um, of 1 times 1 is what? Equals 0, yeah. So that implies that k tensor 1 equal to 0 and um, 1 tensor k equal to zero, right? Now, one tensor anything non-zero is non-zero. Does that make sense? Is one in Pac-Man? I mean, are we quotient? Did we ever quotient by one? So if you think about it, if I have whatever, comma, one, or if I have whatever, or one, comma, whatever, right? If that's my representative, can that be one in the tensor? Or can that be zero in the tensor? I don't, I don't think it can, because that one there means that we're not, it's not, the, it's not unless one is an element, of Pac-Man somehow, right? Maybe, maybe it could be. Maybe it could be for the right choice of ring and right choice of module. Maybe, that, maybe those could be zero, OK? I, I should probably allow that. But I'm pretty sure it's not the case for our currently considered module. So I'm not, I mean, if I had that as a calculational principle, we'd be good. But you can already see, right, that this should I mean, certainly, um, you know, if k is a multiple, of m, then k is congruent, 
you know, to zero mod mod m, right? Over here, if k is multiple of huh? I'm getting m times n here, aren't I? M times n. Ah, I can't do. I'm not saying it's wrong. I just so. Well, yeah. Oh, fine. <laughs> All right. Well, he has since. So let me just save my. <clears throat> let's save this and see if he rescues my, rescues me from my indecision. So here's what he writes. He writes m. Tensor. Oh, sorry, not m tensor, but m times one tensor one. Oh, I think that's just my calculation above, except with m replaced with k. Is um, okay, fine. M tensor one. Uh, but up, but up, but up. Oh, m is specific here, isn't it? That m. So this is zero, <laughs> zero tensor one. All right, which is zero by by one, and likewise n of one tensor one is one tensor n, which is one tensor zero, which by the way is zero. So what's that show? Okay, so k divides m and k divides n. So it has order So that means that k has to divide the GCD? Is that right? Okay. Well, we want equality, right? So at that point, he introduces the map. He says, look at the map phi from z mod mz. Uh, oh, not tensor. Oh, no, yes. Sorry. Ugh. I think we're about to use corollary. Uh, 12, yeah. Z mod n, z. To the tensor product by what? Oh, wait a minute. Not to the tensor product. To z mod dz. How are we going to define that? So phi of, uh, he says, a mod m and b mod n equal to a b mod d. He said this is well defined since d divides both m and n. It's clearly z bilinear. All right. It's clearly z bilinear. And the, so the induced map big phi from corollary 12 maps 1 tensor 1 to 1 in dz. So the induced map phi maps 1 tensor 1 in here to 1 in z mod dz. But of course 1 in z mod dz has what order? Or D. So in particular, Z, M, Z, tensor Z, N, Z has order at least D. Thus, 1 tensor 1 is an element of order D. And this big phi, in fact, gives an isomorphism from the tensor product of this and this and that. So. OK, anyway, um, to give some easier example, So if we have like Z 20 tensor, you know, Z 30 over the, over the integers, that's isomorphic to what? Z 10, all right.
fit in a few more examples here. Let's see here. Um, next example four. He wants to, we want to look at Q mod Z. Tensor over Z with, uh, I guess, Q mod Z again is what he does. And um, a simple tensor has the form A over B mod Z. Tensor. What's a simple tensor, guys? A simple tensor is one that's formed by the, just the tensor product of two elements. Not everything, you know, Oh, I wrote something down that was wrong before. Um, well, no, I'm not sure it was wrong, but, uh, well, curses. Anyway, I'm gonna, one thing at a time here. I'll get back to it. Um, so, for, this is for some rational numbers, A over B, C over D, right? Um, so here's the, here's the calculation he shows us. So we have A over B. Um, if you don't mind, I'm just going to write A over B tensor. I'm going to drop the mod Z because it's getting really old. C over D. Well, that's equal to, let's see what we can do here. D times A over B D. Tensor C over C over D. So the reason there's, this D is existing, right? This is, he just divided and, and multiplied by D, which is an integer, right? So that's allowed. And then what? Um, next move. Again, these are all being done mod Z. Um, so the next move here is to go A over BD, tensor D over, D times C over D. This is all in the, that slot, right? Which is actually A over BD, tensor C, but C is zero mod Z. You remember A, B, C, D here are integers. <laughs> so, so, oops. <laughs> so that's, uh, yeah. But that was an arbitrary simple tensor. And so it follows that the tensor product over Z of Q mod Z with Q mod Z is, well, zero. And he says that this generalizes for any divisible abelian group and torsion abelian group B he says this is generally true, A tensor B, where A is divisible. What's that mean? A billion group. I'm not sure I know what that means. Do you guys know? Torsion. For example, he gives us an example, Q tensor Q mod Z is zero. I mean, torsion means that it doesn't have up to isomorphic, up to isomorphism, it's something that there's no copy of like Z2 in the, if you were to direct some decompose, what's torsion? Right, every, ele very good, every element of the group has finite order, right, is, is, a, is another way to say it, uh, a better way. Um, and I think divisible abelian group, hmm, well.
second n, n x always has uh, x solution for n y and, and y in the uh, in, in, in a here, right? A solution x not equal to zero. No, I mean n not equal to zero. Oh, uh, not x not equal to zero, but x. Solution x in a. So you think that that defines divisibility? I think so. Okay. That would make sense. I mean, that's definitely true for Q. Yeah. So, but anyway, this problem occurs more generally in that kind of context. What's that again? Oh, this? Yeah, I mean the, the A tensor. Uh, A tensor B, uh, this, yeah, this is a Z tensor. And these are all mod Z everywhere. No, I mean, we can make the tensor. Oh, this one. Yeah, yeah, I'm sorry. I know what you're. Okay. I'm sorry, guys. Yes, that was a Z tensor. Yes. All right, so he then goes on to talk about how you can take the tensor product of of maps. You can take two R module homomorphisms from their tensor product. Um, so, you know, basically if you have T going from M to N and you had S going from A to B, something like that, you know, you can, you can construct <clears throat> um, T tensor S from where to where. And you can probably guess how that's defined. If I had T tensor S, this is all over some ring, okay. I mean, the tensors are over some ring. So if I feed this M tensor A, what's the, uh, what's the, what's the definition? Yep. And so he spends about a page justifying this and elaborating on why it's reasonable. And then <clears throat> we reach some sort of uh, arithmetic between tensor products and direct products, which is kind of fun. All right. And well, first of all, he extends, he talks about, you can talk the tensor product of more than two things. You can talk about the tensor product of three or four K things just like we can took the direct sum of more than two things, right? And this theorem 17 shows you how they um, interface. So here it goes. M direct sum M prime tensored over R with N is isomorphic to M tensor R N direct sum with M prime tensor Rn. All right. And shockingly, M tensor Rn plus direct sum N prime is up to isomorphism M tensor R. See, know it all high school students could uh, 
tell you these rules, right? Oh yeah, I remember that from algebra. These are unsurprising. And those extend to, um, you know, you can replace those with direct sums, arbitrary direct sums, actually. So instead of taking the direct sum of two things, you could take direct sum over an index set, and this is still true. It doesn't say finite, arbitrary direct sums. And then corollary 18 here says something I told you already. It says that um, if we have the module, if we have a module n which is up to isomorphism, the free, the free module of invariant basis number n, which I have not defined. But um, so if, if you have a module in our module n which is up to isomorphism, just our n, all right, then. Um, S, uh, S, ten, S tensor R, um, Rn is isomorphic to Sn. So here S is an extension of scalars. He says an extension of scalars from R to S. Um, I, I mean, it may be more than this, but certainly this is the one I'm most interested in, is when S um, takes R as a subring. That's the most. I mean, I think you can do things, it's, it's a little bit more general than that what he presents. I think he just, he works with like a homomorphism um, from R into S, where F of R is identified in the center of, of S or something like that. That's the, the first couple pages of the section's about, but it's also related to that. But this is not just that. I mean, his, his extension of scalars, he, before he defines tensor product of an amendment, he talks about extension of scalars. And so if you look there, I don't think S has to contain R as a, a subring, but that's, for me, the most important and interesting case. Are the real numbers a subset of the complex numbers? We can argue, but certainly they contain a homomorphic, in fact, a isomorphic image of the reals is inside the complexes, right? So you can look at the complexes as an extension of the real scalars. So one example of this would be complexes, real tensored, Rn is up to isomorphism Cn. So in fact, the complexification that I show you guys in linear algebra is really this. Complexification of a vector space is just the tensor product of the vector space with the complex numbers up to isomorphism. So my notation I use for you guys is like the V sub C, right? V sub C is up to isomorphism, really just C. Tensor, my vector space over the reals. Those are isomorphic. That's all that complexification construction really does, is to replace the real numbers with complex numbers for the scalar multiplication. Now, finally, at the end of this section, Proposition 21, he does show what you just said, uh, King. He shows something about our algebras, and he shows that we can take the tensor product of our algebras to produce a new, new algebra called the, well, the tensor product of our algebras. And, and so if you have an R algebra A and an R algebra B, or a two algebras, A and B. <laughs> so you guys can tell me, if I have A tensor B over R, then how am I going to multiply this and this? What's the new algebra multiplication in the tensor product? I heard an AX, tensor BY. In fact, that makes sense, and there's a half page explaining why that makes sense in Dumb and Foot. 
Uh, yeah, A is an A, X is an A, B is an B, Y is an B. Yeah. Okay. So anyway, I, I think I've shown you just enough to get you into trouble. This is about as much as I learned when I took um, what's called um, algebraic topology. In algebraic topology, you look at certain abelian groups from one perspective, and so you calculate the homology, which is given in terms of these, these you know, diagrams of maps and spaces and so forth. And depending on the, the space you're looking at, you'll either get, you might, some, some homology groups might be like the integers, some might be like the integers mod, you know, z mod n, some of them are like z mod 2z, depending on the shape of the space and so forth. And then there's this thing called the universal coefficients theorem, or the Kunith formula, and you end up taking tensor products of the homology groups with another group. In the algebra, you need to actually work that out is essentially what I've showed you today. But you have one distinct advantage over me when you take algebraic topology. You at least have some kind of sense of what a module is, and it won't just be dark magic. Like, I just, I just accepted these things on faith in grad school at some point that, I mean, it didn't make sense to me, but Z tensor Z is Z. I'm like, okay, fine, you know. I made it through, <laughs> but it wasn't a good, it wasn't a good thing. <laughs> so you, you at least know where to read if you need to read more about modules, right? So, and this really should be a standalone course of itself, the whole, you know. But we're not done. The next thing we're going to turn to, though, is more the problem of canonical forms. And uh, it's basically chapter 12 in Dumb and Foot. So thanks, guys.